So using the same framework that um, Ajaya introduced in the introductory talk, um, I call it scale instead of importance, just because I think importance can also refer to the outcome of the whole framework. Um, and I think scale is a little clearer, but they mean the same thing. Um, to tackle that one first, so the latest figures are um, something like 77 billion land-dwelling farmed animals raised and slaughtered every year globally, which is just you know huge numbers. It's like 11 for every human on Earth. Um, they're not treated very well at all. So this is an example of gestation crates, um, which are you know tiny enclosures for uh, pregnant pigs, so small that they can't even you know turn around, can barely move forward and back a little. Um, and this is how you know most of them are raised these days in modern animal agriculture. So it's quite an unfortunate situation. I won't go into too many details on, on all the issues because um, I expect most of you are familiar with that, and it's, it's sad to rehash those. Um, but you know, historian Yuval Noah Harari, who was the author of the book *Sapiens: A Brief History of Humankind*, called it the worst crime in history. Um, you know, even compared to all the things that humans have done to other people. Um, so very tragic. Um, many people have uh, talked about it as one of the top, as being part of the top of the list whenever it comes to things that are ancestors might, or our descendants might deplore about us. Um, so, you know, it's something that we recognize, a lot of us recognize as a huge issue, but it's not exactly clear how do we solve it um, as a society. Um, more compelling to some people is the, the fate of um, future animals. So, you know, if this sort of treatment continues um, in the long term, you know, as countries like, you know, India and China are developing, they have rapidly increasing animal product consumption right now, they're adopting, you know, our, our, our American diets, unfortunately. Um, and if that continues, and especially, you know, as humanity grows even beyond that, if we continue abusing animals, it could be even larger than it is now, which is very unfortunate. Um, people also consider the welfare of wild animals to be quite important. So just as, you know, the number of farmed animals, we, we talk about that one because it dwarfs the number of other animals um, used by humans. The number of wild animals dwarfs that number even. Um, so it's not as clear what we can do about wild animal suffering. Um, but it is clear that it's, it's an important issue that we should think about. Um, other people also uh, strongly oppose animal agriculture for other reasons, like it's damage to public health, damage to the environment, and to the economy, so things like the amount spent on farm subsidies, um, things like the caloric difference whenever you go from plant food to um, animal-based food, you know, it's something like a nine to one calorie conversion, so that's like throwing 90% of your food out every time you, you eat animal products, um, which is not a good way to feed the world, you know, given how many people still suffer from hunger. Um, but, you know, I think the animal case is, is extremely compelling on its own, so I won't talk too much about the other ones, but I recognize them as important, and I can talk about them more later if anyone's interested. Um, second part of the framework, we have neglect in this. Um, of course, as Ajay alluded to, the vast majority of domestic animals are farmed and they receive only a small portion of those donations. Um, you know, most of it is going to things like animal shelters, which although very worthy causes, um, don't represent most of the animals um, suffering at human hands. Um, and you know, even, even this bubble, even the 3% figure that Ajay gave, um, most recently I saw that that was for animals and the environment. So you know, animals are even receiving just a, just a portion of that. Um, and given their numbers, it's very something we should work on. Um, tractability, so this is an example of social change for different movements that's occurred um, over the past you know, couple centuries. And um, we've seen really rapid social change um, happen. It's not entirely clear, um, and it might never be, how much of this has been from activism as compared to other things like technological change or broader political shifts. Um, but as we've seen with things like interracial marriage, prohibition, women's suffrage, um, change can happen very quickly. And there have been you know, activist movements associated right before these changes happen, which is correlational, not very strong evidence, um, but it shows that there's at least you know, some chance that activists have been causing these things. Additionally, we have evidence from you know, psychology, sociology, marketing, that shows that we can influence uh, both individual behavior and attitudes, as well as um, social trends, so things like getting new products on the market and stuff like that. Um, and then we've also had evidence in animal advocacy itself showing how much change that we, we've already created um, that really shows that we, we, we can make progress on the problem. All that being said, I do think this is the weakest of these three areas for animal advocacy, um, mainly because I think it's just very hard to, to tease out causation from correlational evidence um, you know, compared to something like anti-malarial nets or other things in global poverty where you can run an RCT and be pretty confident that it was your intervention that was making the change. Um, as an additional perspective, we can look quantitatively at the cause. 
Um, so this is one of the most compelling figures to me that I actually prepared for to give talks because it's not the one that we use usually, but just whenever I saw this, even though I've been working in this field so long, it still kind of blew my mind. 12 to 25 years of factory farm suffering spread per dollar. And you know, this is, this is an example from corporate outreach, which is where you try and convince companies to adopt new welfare policies. Um, so I selected that because it's the most robustly evidenced um, area of animal advocacy. It's, it's, it's probably, I mean, many people think it's not the highest in expected value. Um, but that's a huge number, and that's the conservative estimate. That's how much we can like be confident in um, from the easy to measure approach. Um, so 12 to 25 years, that's decades for every dollar. Uh, I think that's absolutely insane and just hugely compelling. Um, if we consider you know, cascading impact, uh, that you know, other companies will be more likely to adopt corporate changes. If we extend our time frame for how long into the future we're looking, um, this increases, of course. Um, so yeah, really compelling in my opinion. Um, and compelling to other people as well, I suppose. Um, so to talk about the evidence that we have that we can use to uh, discuss animal advocacy as an entire cause area, but also talk about which changes um, we should seek to make within that area, what interventions we should use, what programs we should want, what charities we should donate to or, or work for. Um, I think these are the main four categories to explain them a bit. Direct observation is things like corporate outreach. So in corporate outreach, we can see this group has been working with this company to make this welfare change. The company then said, all right, group, like we've worked with you and, and you've convinced us you've applied enough public pressure. You have you know, convinced us that it, from a business perspective, it's, it's not bad for our bottom line, especially given the consumer demand for these, these higher welfare products. And they say, all right, we're gonna make this change. And you know, we've seen examples where there's been maybe a consumer pressure to, to do that. So like companies that um, use eggs, for example, and there's been a big campaign to eliminate battery cages in the US um, for egg laying hens, which are just similar to those gestation crates, um, very small cages for them. And um, we've seen companies that weren't campaigned against just, just make no changes. You know, they fly under the radar. They don't have a big public pressure against them. And it's not until a, a organization you know, talks to them that they actually do implement it. Um, so direct observation seems like a very strong form of evidence. Um, also strong is direct experimentation. So if we were able to run those RCTs, we can do this to some extent, maybe with something like an online advertisement where we can you know, A-B test, give one person the animal advocacy intervention, give another person a control intervention and tell the difference. But they're still very limited and we don't have many right now. So they don't account for like long-term outcomes. They don't account for how people talk about that with other people, which then generates discussion and potentially more change. And as I'll talk about in a bit, um, Social effects are, are hugely important for, for any sort of um, large-scale behavior change you want to create. Um, similarly, we don't have much evidence right now for history and case studies, not because they don't exist, but because the research is very, very young in that area. Um, my organization, Animal Charity Evaluators, has been trying to look into this. So we've done case studies of social movements, looking at what tactics they used, which ones worked, which ones didn't work. You know, for example, one of ours right now is on um, the Welsh language movement, so trying to get um, Welsh as a, an established language in, in Wales. And um, they actually had an interesting example where that's, that movement was um, achieving huge success, but then a similar movement for a similar type of, of uh, language um, being you know, revived in a sense um, was, was you know, a failure and didn't really make any changes. So we have an intern right now who's actually finalizing her project, comparing those two and saying, well, what did they do that works compared to what, what happened for the other one not to work? Um, of course, the issue with that is very low sample size. We're trying to tease out, tease out causation from correlation usually. Um, so it, it's weaker evidence, but evidence nonetheless. Um, and then four, uh, this is a rather weak form of evidence, but we have a lot of it. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that one in the next slide. So the two that I think we're using right now mostly are direct observation and general psychology and sociology. Um, so an example of that fourth one is this experiment, which was done unrelated to animals, um, but about hotel towels. Um, so it's a kind of famous one about um, an interesting quirk in, in human behavior. Um, they gave people two messages to try and get them to reuse their towels in the hotel. Um, this helps the environment, you have to use less time washing it, it helps the hotel because they have to have less labor, have less you know, energy spending, all those sorts of things. Um, and they gave people a message about environmentalism, which is just, it has a huge environmental impact. And then they gave one about um, lots of other people are doing it. <laughs> you know, some high percentage, I think it was in the 70s, um, of people are reusing their towels. And from a like, logical perspective, it should be just, oh, environmental is um, compelling. You know, that's the reason we should be making these changes. But as many of you would guess, um, it was much more impactful to use the social message compared to the environmental one. 
Um, they even went further and compared the social message of talking about guests at the hotel generally to guests who just stayed in your room, um, which shouldn't make a difference, right? But it even had more of an impact when the guests were in your room that they were talking about. Um, it bumped up to something like 50%. Um, so that's the sort of evidence that we can use. The way this might inform us is to say, well, in our messaging, so when we're designing a leaflet or something, we should talk about the social effects, talk about how many other people are making you know, changes to their diets, um, shopping for better products, eating more plant-based foods. Um, it could also indicate that we should aim for social interventions that create you know, peer support between people. Um, so for example, uh, getting a news story instead of just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an individual, because a news story generates conversation, it generates um, peer attitude change, um, which could be really compelling. Um, and of course, this is just one study. I don't mean to say that this study itself is very strong evidence for anything, but this, the fact that social, social pressure is very, very important has been established in many studies. Um, so now I want to talk about the different uh, methods people are using to reduce the suffering of farmed animals, um, and also touch on wild animals. So welfare improvements are what I've alluded to before, and um, their, their pros, I think, are that they're particularly robust. Um, we can be pretty confident that these changes are happening as a result of donor dollars or of you know, labor hours. And um, for lots of people, that's very important. You know, they think things that have weak evidence um, tend to not be very impactful, so you really need strong evidence to pull you away from that, that prior belief that you come into the situation with. Um, I don't find that as convincing. I'm pretty okay with speculative things and kind of just care about pure expected value in a sense. But I still think welfare improvements are very promising. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, they create common knowledge. So when we're talking about the social effects, this is um, knowledge that I have and that you have, but also that I know that you have and you know that I know that you have and ad infinitum. Um, and this is something that can uh, engender conversation it can get people feeling that peer pressure um, that makes them change their attitudes and behaviors. Um, and these create animal-friendly precedent in society, so they establish our society as one that's making substantive, concrete changes for um, these animals, which then establishes them as like people who are in our political cir moral circles, people that we care about, people that are relevant to policy making, which can then lead to further change down the road, so like the adoption of more plant-based foods. Um, which reduces a lot of suffering, because even if you have these welfare improvements, you know, this is a cage-free facility. So if you hear about these cage-free reforms, they're going from battery cages, which are, which are horrible, horrible places, to a situation like this, where they're in a, a cage of you know, other animals' flesh. And we, 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 the research seems to indicate that this is an improvement for welfare, um, but it's, it's, it's not much, of course, in the scope of things. Um, it could have potential negative effects, so it could increase complacency. It could uh, devalue animals in a way. So some people have argued that um, social justice movements build on absolute terms. They say, you know, we should demand nothing less than abolition. So abolition of, you know, segregation, um, abolition of the denial of certain groups to be able to vote, things like that. Um, and if we're making these, like, incremental changes, it might devalue animals and say, oh, well, you know, they don't deserve true liberation or true abolition. They just deserve, you know, slightly larger cages or, you know, slightly more space to, to roam around in. Um, and that could be a potential harm. Lots of people are pretty convinced by that. I, I'm somewhat convinced. Um, another one is undercover investigations. So these rely on indirect impact, um, which, which is sort of a negative, um, but they reach a ton of people. So you, you publicize this investigation that shows cruelty in a farm, um, and then this, people react to it by changing their diets maybe. Um, sometimes it's pretty clear that companies react by changing their welfare policies. Um, which can be pretty impactful. So groups like Mercy for Animals, um, they, an investigator will gain employment at a farm and then um, you know, take that footage with hidden cameras and then be able to talk about it, do a press conference like this one and get news stories. Um, so I think from that social perspective, this is really promising. Um, it creates you know, moral outrage in society about whatever happened. Um, and there are general psychology findings that um, moral outrage and you know being actually deeply angry and unsettled like we get whenever we see the the cruel treatment is um, a key part of overcoming system justification system justification is just what it sounds like it's our tendency to um, make up reasons to justify the status quo um, so for those reasons I think investigations can be really impactful um, they seem to have less of a downside than welfare improvements so they don't risk as much complacency or viewing these um, animals as, as, as lesser in some sense um, you know, undercover investigations have a lot of historical precedent. They've been used for oppressed groups of humans, and um, they don't at least directly indicate that 
um, things are getting better and that we should be complacent and we've done enough. Um, you know, they're pointing out the fact that there is still lots of cruelty going on. Next, we have um, the individual approach, which is grassroots outreach. Um, so this is reaching an exceptionally large number of people for very low cost. So we have things like leaflets, things like online ads, where you can reach people for just pennies on the dollar. Um, and even if just a, a fraction of a percentage of those people actually change their behaviors, that still you know, can be a whole lot of change in terms of number of animals spared. For example, if, if you're getting them to uh, go vegetarian or even just reduce their consumption of animal products. Um, the, the con of this is that it does rely on our ability to change individual attitudes and behavior um, with a short interaction, which is something some people are skeptical of. So you might say you can't even get that fraction of a percent because all you're doing is showing them an ad. In order for them to make a substantive change, like to change their diet, at least an, enough of them, you really need a prolonged behavior. So you need a friend who's doing it. You need a news story that they can then talk about with their friends at work and then you know have a, a conversation between five people who does it. So then you have the peer pressure for you know people to take action based on it and things like that. Um, so I'm a little more optimistic about the systemic stuff myself, investigations and, and welfare reform. But I see this as definitely cost effective and uh, definitely compared to, to human interventions to be really impactful. Um, next we have an interesting one, um, which is animal free foods. Um, this is something that's been getting a ton of press lately. Um, so this is a meatball, of course, but it's not just any meatball. Um, it's the world's first cultured one that came out earlier this year. Um, so this is um, real cow cells, but um, no cow had to be killed from, for this. Um, so you can make these with, with just a biopsy of a living animal and take those cells and then uh, proliferate them in, in, in a you know, facility um, similar to a laboratory, um, similar to the way certain things are done in medicine, the way they're you know, growing these tissues. And um, this can create the same taste and texture. I mean, it's the exact, physically identical. Um, so this has been called like excuse-free um, animal product alternatives. Because even if you want, like even if you think that the, the vegan options, the plant-based options are um, the same in taste and texture, you can still have excuses. You can still say, well, the origin, like, you know, it, it, it's, it's not the exact same molecules. It's, um, you know, not cells and uh, animal cells, it's plant cells and things like that. But this takes away all the excuses. If you're going to want to, you know, not eat cultured meat, then you essentially have to have some sort of justification, like I, I just, you know, like, you know, the the past of what happened, or like, you know, I just like animal cruelty, um, which is of course something nobody's going to say. Um, so in that way, it could be really impactful. It could be a game changer. Um, of course, there's unclear technological roadblocks, unclear social roadblocks. So some people do are like weirded out by this. You know, it's something that people think is like unnatural maybe in some sense. Um, and it, it seems like we have potential to overcome that, but it's not clear how much of a roadblock it'll be. Um, Open Philanthropy Project, which I'm sure many of you know about, um, is a major force in the effective altruism community, and they look broadly at different interventions. And um, they wrote a report on cultured meat that um, their opinion was that it was pretty far off technologically. So that means we could still have a lot of suffering before it comes and we still need to do advocacy. Um, my personal opinion is that technology moves along, there are business innovations for it, um, you know, people wanting to do it for reasons other than purely altruistic reasons, um, and, and technology never backslides, except for in like really weird situations. So it seems like technological progress will put, push forward, but it seems to me that we have a lot of uncertainty as to whether when better technologies develop, they'll be adopted successfully. Um, so I think social um, facilitation of these products Things like what, um, there's a group called the Good Food Institute that's um, doing a lot of public promotion of, of, of these alternative animal products. Um, that seems really impactful to me. Um, but of course we have some people like Alcala Perumal um, who is working for, or he founded Mufri. Um, they're doing cultured milk, um, which is probably technologically easier than creating actual animal tissues. And um, you know, that could alleviate a ton of suffering by having this. Um, you know, analog that is indistinguishable from the, the animal products themselves. Um, next we have research, this is what I do. Um, so this is an example of some of the basic research we've done, really, really straightforward conclusions, um, but really impactful. You know, there's a difference in cost effectiveness between an animal shelter and an ACE recommended organization um, in terms of animals saved or animals spared. Um, and the difference is huge. You know, you can do this calculation in many different ways, but it shows that there's a really big difference, which can then help donors move their money towards ACE recommended organizations on the right, instead of uh, spending as much on those animal shelters on the left. Of course, this is because so much money is spent on these animal shelters and because it's difficult. It's not to say that they are, you know, less morally worthy in, in, in some deep sense. 
Um, it's just to say that on the margin, we can get more impact by our dollars given to ACE recommended organizations. Of course, current research is, is, is harder and deals with more difficult questions than this. So tackling things like, of those interventions that I've just showed you, which ones should we be sending marginal funding to? Um, things like, how do we actually create messaging that will ensure people adopt animal product alternatives like sophisticated plant-based products and uh, you know, cultured meat? Um, I think the value of research as to whether we should spend our marginal resources is, is very up in the air right now. Um, I think there's a very limited amount of research going on in, in, in animal advocacy, which indicates that um, there's low, potentially low hanging fruit and we should at least investigate it. Um, so right now there's a million dollars being spent on um, the empirical, so object level um, animal advocacy research doing like RCTs to see whether there actually is an impact on people's diets from those. Um, and I think that that project um, that's going on right now, it just started actually, uh, will tell us a lot about the value of research and whether we should continue with it um, in the longer term. Um, but it's where I'm spending my time right now, so obviously I think there's something in it. Um, but, but we'll see, we'll find out whether it, it should receive more marginal donations in the long run. Um, finally, last thing I'll, I'll touch on is wild animal welfare. So as I mentioned, the scale of this is absolutely huge, um, but it has unclear tractability. It is very neglected, even among animal causes. So when we talk about the welfare of wild animals, this isn't just environmentalism and ensuring that these animals have their habitat to live in, but it's actually uh, asking, are they living good lives? You know, if you're a wild animal out there, um, you're not gonna feel justified in like having some disease happen to you because it's like part of the circle of life. No, you like, you don't wanna be suffering from that, you know, flesh eating disease or, or you know, you don't wanna be a gazelle eaten by that lion. You don't care about the, you know, broader circle of life. But this is difficult because we have to consider the impact to all sorts of different creatures, um, including humans to some extent. Um, and understand whether the changes we make will affect population sizes in a way that like tips the ecosystem out of balance such that there's more suffering or a way that it you know increases the, the risk of global warming which could be bad for humans and, and animals alike and all those sorts of questions are really really tough so I think research um, and very basic advocacy getting more people involved in this is impactful um, I don't think in the immediate future we're going to be doing like any macro interventions to really make changes um, so that's the last area, and I just want to talk briefly about how you can help. So of course, donations to, to ACE's top charities, um, I think are hugely impactful. I mean, we, we, we chose those charities because they'd be the most impactful. Um, you can go on our website and find them, and I'm also happy to answer your questions about them. Um, you can work for animal advocacy organizations. That includes um, our top charities, but also other ones that you feel really compelled by or things where you have comparative advantage in. So if you're, you know, have a particular skill in law, for example, um, then a group like the Non-Human Rights Project that's trying to establish legal personhood and the ability for animals to, to have more of a legal presence and actually file suit in court could be just the thing for you. Um, there's an interesting opportunity for being an undercover investigator. That is hard, and I don't think it's particularly suited for many people, but if anyone's really interested in it, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, it involves, you know, grueling work. You have to work at a farm, essentially, and, you know, maybe do things that are participating in the violence that you're opposed to. But then you capture footage from those. You help um, support the uh, press conferences like you saw. You help get more coverage of this. And even more than that, it, it builds you a public platform that you can use to then um, advocate for further changes on behalf of animals. Um, this is actually something I consider really seriously, but... Um, I've decided to do other things, but I still think it's, it's, it's definitely a top tier choice. And I'd love to see someone who's, you know, maybe just out of college or, or something like that um, start down this path if, if they think they can do it and uh, use that as a public platform to advocate. Um, you can also join me in research. So uh, this is interesting because you can do it on a very short term basis and it can be really impactful. So even just like blog posts that people can do about a particular social movement, maybe one that you've been involved in or one that you just have a particular interest in can be really informative to then, you know, sweep into our um, big bucket of evidence and uh, be able to make more macro decisions. Excuse me. So like um, I told you about the, the language one that's going on right now. And although that's being done by an ACE intern, I think you can do those outside of ACE or you could, you know, be an ACE intern and do those. Um, and then the most important one I think is, is, is volunteering and not in a professional capacity, but just spreading the word. Um, be a conduit. I think this is hugely impactful.